Hello and welcome to our online upper room studies. I'm coming to you from South Waxahachie. You may hear my dogs bark. Uh, there's a little bunny rabbit that's been taunting the dogs out near the patio, so just ignore if you hear my dogs barking. We're continuing our online worship from First United Methodist Church and our Bible studies and anything where we can continue to connect with you and, of course, keep everyone as safe as possible. I hope this finds you well. I miss you all so very much, and I hope to be with you soon. Well, we'll continue to meet over some of these upper room readings. Uh, if you have an upper room magazine and you are a regular upper, read, upper room reader, uh, you'll be able to find these devotionals in your magazine. But if you're not, you can always access them on upperroom.org. You can get a whole month free. But I'm just using these as devotional subjects and scriptures as a jumping off point for our subjects. So I'll give you enough detail that you can follow along even if you're not reading the devotionals along. If you are an upper room reader, well this can be your pre or your post study, but I hope everyone will follow along with the scriptures. Now I do encourage upper room devotional readers you can spend a short time in study or use it as a preparation for a deeper study. It's very meaningful as a morning or evening study. It just gives you a connection with Christians all over the world reading and studying scripture. It's a beautiful daily meditation. Well, now that I've given you a commercial <clears throat> for Upper Room, let's get into our study for the day. The devotionals for March 31st and April 1st make powerful statements about our relationship to God and God's presence in our lives. In Tuesday's devotional, written by Webb Smith of Georgia, the title of the devotion is The Right Place. Webb lives up Psalm 62, the fifth through the eighth verses, to remind us that our place is always with God. Before I read the psalm, let's just consider some basic information we should be recognizing as we read and interpret a psalm. First, the psalms are a collection of 150 prayers, songs, liturgies, and poems written by a variety of authors. Second, most psalms are introduced with a superscription, it's that little something written at the top that explains or defines the purpose and sometimes who the psalm was written for. Such as in our Psalm 62. To the leader, according to Jeduthun, a psalm of David. Now Jeduthun was one of the three masters of music appointed by King David. Sometimes a psalm, well it might indicate the instruments for flute or strings that it would be accompanied by. Or within the verses of the psalm, it might indicate a marking selah, as is between some of our verses in Psalm 62. Selah is an unknown term, perhaps indicating a musical interlude or a time of praise. Third, as we analyze the psalm, we must remember biblical scholars categorize the psalms by their various genres or their literary types. It's important to recognize the function of the psalm. For example, <clears throat> we read a newspaper article in a different way than we might look at a short story of fiction. They are both different literary forms and they have different purposes. The newspaper of co article, of course, is to inform us and the short story well, it's meant to entertain us. This category of analysis is called form criticism, where literature is categorized by its function. The psalms are labeled either by prayers, hymns, songs of praise, wisdom psalms, instructional psalms, royal psalms that are written for Israel's kings, liturgies for worship, and other forms, such as acrostic poems and festivals. 
mystical song. It's just helpful to identify the label placed on each song as we read it so that we get a deeper understanding of it. The 150 psalms in the book of Psalms are actually divided into five books, and each book closes with one or two verses of doxology that encompasses the entire book. I hope that as we look at Psalm 62, that at some point you'll be able to look at the entire Psalm 62. I'll just be reading verses 1 through 2 and then skip to verses 5 through 8. Here is Psalm 62. To the leader, according to Jettison, a psalm of David. For God alone my soul waits in silence. For him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation. My fortress, I shall never be shaken. For God alone my soul waits in silence. For my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor, my mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Now as we prepare ourselves to study God's word, let us unite our hearts together as we pray together. O oh God, you are our God alone, the one in whom we trust. As we pray together, open our hearts and our minds to your presence. We long to meet you and to hear your voice. We come with confidence because you are present with each one of us. Your holy presence and steadfast love comforts us. Even as we are apart by physical distance, you unite us by your spirit. And so we praise you alone as our souls wait in silence for our hope is found in you. Pour out your spirit on each one of us that we may be filled with you, our rock and our salvation. Amen. In our Upper Room Devotion, The Right Place, by Webb Smith, we encounter the story of Webb's two large dogs. Webb tells the story that twice a week, when his wife gets up at 4.30 for an early shift, the dogs get up early with her too. And when she leaves, well, they become restless. They think they are alone. Their people have left them. They forget Webb is still at home in bed. And until he whispers their names and reminds them of his presence, and then they become calm and they relax. <coughs> Webb reminds us, too, that as God's children, we often react that way in our own lives. And you see, my dog text is helping me tell the story of the dog. Things happen to us, like this pandemic. We may feel separated from God and forget God is always with us. We may even distance ourselves from God, but God never removes his presence from us. God is always with us, providing strength and help in time of need. We are never alone, and we can always trust God. In a similar way, the story of Gideon is also a story of God remaining present with his people, even in times where God may seem distant. As we look back at the devotional from April 1st, written by Marion Brown of Florida, we read these verses from Judges that share the story of the angel of the Lord visiting Gideon and exclaiming, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. It is interesting to note that the name Gideon is Hebrew for hearer, 
which means hacker. In our culture, a hacker is someone who uses unauthorized data to break into computers or cuts things roughly. Bible scholars have concluded that Gideon's nickname was based on his actual hacking down of foreign deities, as in the story where he set up an altar to the Lord and tore down his father's altar to one of those foreign deities on the same night. The story occurs after his call from the Lord in Judges 6, 25 through 27. Now, here is the reading from Judges 6, 11 through 16, entitled Call of Gideon. Note that our hero Gideon was so afraid of the Midianites that he was hiding. This story is reminiscent of other Old Testament stories where God calls an unlikely person into service, and that person is changed. For example, Jacob wrestling all night, or Moses at the burning bush. Here's the call of Gideon. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the Abiezrite. As his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Gideon answered him, But sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all the wonderful deeds that our ancestors recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has cast us off and given us into the hand of the Midian. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. I hereby commission you. He responded, But sir, how can I deliver Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike down the Midianites, every one of them. As we look at this scripture, we understand how Psalm 62 a song of trust in God alone, and the call of Gideon remind us that God is ever-present in all our lives. God never leaves us and is always working in each one of our lives. God is there even when we are not cognizant of the fact. God's presence is, co is constant and always there. God knows far beyond what we could ever comprehend. So we can trust his powerful connection to all of us. In the scripture from Judges, the angel of the Lord goes so far as to call Gideon a mighty warrior. And when Gideon gives all the reasons he is not, the Lord gives him the most powerful reason. The Lord said, I will be with you. Through the angel, God promises to be with Gideon, and he promises to be with you and with me. Not only in times of trouble, but every day, all the time, in all our times, for eternity. Now that's a promise we can all count on. In the devotional, Marion goes on to say, I completely understand what Gideon was going through. God calls me ambassador for Christ, yet I am not worthy to be a diplomatic representative for Christ Jesus. In 2 Corinthians, she quotes chapter 5, verse 20, and it says, So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled 
to God. It is not we ourselves who are worthy. No. Marion explains it like this. But the promises of God's constant presence is what allows us to fill the role and live up to that title and task. What's your title? What's your task? What is God calling you to do, mighty warrior? The Lord says to put your name in. I will be with you. I will be with you. Repeat it again. Mighty warrior, the Lord says to, I will be with you. You and I have the presence of the Lord with us all day, every day, now and forever. Last year, I read a story about a pastor who was working late on a Saturday night at his church. Now, I read this story on the internet, so it must be true. His church is the Almighty God Tabernacle. Now, after, while he was working, he decided to call his wife to let her know that he was going to be on his way. It was about 10 p.m., but she didn't answer. The phone just rang and rang. The pastor thought it was odd. So he finished up a few more things, and then he called again. This time, she answered right away, and he asked her, Why didn't you answer my first call? And she said, The phone never rang. Well, they thought it was just nothing, and they didn't think much of it at all. On the following Monday, the pastor received a call from the telephone that he had actually rang first on Saturday night when he was trying to reach his wife. A man's voice spoke and wanted to know why he had called on that Saturday night. Well, the pastor didn't know what to say because he didn't realize the guy was talk what the guy was talking about until the man said, it rang and rang but I didn't answer. The pastor began to put the incident together and then he figured that he dialed the man's number in error and, and so he apologized for disturbing him, explaining, I, I just intended to call my wife. Well, the man said, that's okay. Let me tell you my story. You see, I was planning to commit suicide on Saturday night. But before I did, I prayed, God, if you're there and you don't want me to do this, give me a sign now. At that point, my phone started to ring. I looked at the caller ID and it said, Almighty God. I was afraid to answer it. That story is quite an example that God is always with us and we don't know when he's working through us to accomplish his will. I don't pretend to know the will of God. I just know he is always at work in our lives and even when we feel hopeless, God is there to provide that last bit of hope he was with that pastor and the man who needed God to show his presence and grace. God works through us and in us and in spite of us sometimes to meet all his divine appointments. Now let me clarify one thing. We are not puppets and God gives us a free will but our lives will go much smoother and easier if we'll just stay connected to God's presence. It reminds us that God uses even our mistakes for good if we're just open to his holy presence in our lives.
God calls each one of us to be his hands, his feet, his mouth, his very last hope who represent him in the world. Yet most of us, we have a difficult time with that concept. We struggle with being good enough, smart enough, just enough of whatever. And yet Psalm 62 promises us we can trust God, trust in him at all times, O oh people. Gideon's story reminds us God's presence will always be enough to answer the call. We are always empowered through Christ's presence to answer any call we might find ourselves called to. Even a phone call where the caller ID says, Almighty God, God is with you, mighty warrior, wherever you are. So let us pray. Go now and rejoice in the Lord always. Do not be afraid or worried about anything, but in everything trust God and pray. Bear fruits of worthy repentance, sharing what you have and being gentle with all. And may God rejoice over you with gladness. May Christ Jesus renew you in his love. And may the Holy Spirit give you peace beyond understanding to guard your hearts and minds in Christ. In the name of Christ, go in the strength you have through the presence of Christ. Amen. See you again in the upper room. The Lord bless you and keep you. Amen.